all Lone Tree? Yes, with the big empty stretch of table, sorry. Good evening and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board, Tuesday, March 12th, 2024, um, regular business meeting. Could everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Item one is adjustments to the agenda. So we do have one adjustment to tonight's agenda. We are going to move item C to the top of our, item, item e. I'm sorry, I'm, oh my goodness, I circled the wrong thing, yep. 9E, <laughs> e, yes. 9E. We are moving 9E to the top of our new business agenda. Are there any other adjustments? That's it. Okay. So, item number two, may I have a motion, please? I approve we um, approve the regular business meeting minutes from Tuesday, February 13, 2024. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. <laughs> item three is comments from the public on agenda items. If there are any members of the public that would like to make a comment, I'm going to ask you to please come up to the podium, state your uh, name and address, and keep your comments to about three minutes. Okay, seeing none, moving on. Comments from our student representative. Hello everybody, it's just me tonight. Jack is at a swim team banquet. Um, so I hope that you all are having a great March and staying dry from all the rain. Um, our students at Pond Cove particularly are having a really great month. They um, are participating in picture book March Madness. Um, so they're voting on various storybooks um, and then the whole school kind of participates in this bracket. Um, kindergarten students in particular had a wonderful time visiting with Dr. Record and reading one of the books involved in the March Madness tournament. Last week, Ponco students celebrated the favorite color day. Um, so students got to wear their favorite colors to school, um, which brought a lot of added joy to the hallways. Um, this week, storyteller Len Cabral is visiting with students and sharing traditional folk tales from Africa, um, Capo Verde, and to be specific, um, and then the Caribbean, so as well as a lot of tales from other countries around the world. Um, and I saw Len Cabral when I was in elementary school, so it's a wonderful tradition that um, is still going. Uh, the fourth graders are beginning to talk about their step up to high school, um, with a notable moment being their selection of musical instruments to play in fifth grade band. Um, and then on that same note, Jack and I are looking forward to kind of going back to the middle, um, back to Pond Cove, excuse me, and um, chatting with the fourth graders about their transition and um, meeting with some other grades as well. Uh, at the middle school, um, the middle school band and chorus has been really thriving as we move into um, what the music department likes to call music in our schools month, um, just due to the sheer amount of music events that are occurring. Uh, so last week, the CMS band and chorus performed for the fourth graders um, to kind of show them what music is like at the middle school and welcoming to them to participate in band and chorus. Um, and then a few days later, a group of sixth grade band and chorus members performed at the sixth grade North Honors Festival. Um, and further, Cape sent a group of students to the District 1, 7th and 8th grade Honors Festival. Um, so huge congratulations to all those students who participated. Um, and then I'm serious when we say that March is Music Month because the 8th grade band is also going to the Maine Band Directors Association competition where they will be performing um, and judged based on the band's playing ability and their sight reading. Um, students have been enjoying a new program piloted um, in February that we heard about a little bit about last meeting um, called Explore Wednesdays, where students have the opportunity to choose from a variety of subjects that are kind of experiential learning based. Um, so during these sessions, students are part participating in everything from cooking to tiny house design, which has been super cool. Um, students also transition to new allied arts classes um, 
recently and have been having a great time exploring those subjects. And then class selection for next year had began today, um, following the middle school's hosting of eighth grade families for the eighth grade open house last night. Um, and then further, the student council had a really uh, successful food drive for Judy's Pantry. Um, and sixth graders had a great time tubing at Seacoast Adventure, which was a fun activity to kind of finish their trimester. And then finally, on a sports note, um, the middle school indoor track team has been really popular, popular this year, with CAPE winning both the boys' and girls' divisions in, the, in both of the first two meets. And then moving on to the high school, um, our one-act play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, went to Thornton Academy um, to compete in the main drama festival regional competition. Two of our actors were recognized as members of the all-festival cast, um, and the ensemble together was awarded a special commendation, so congratulations to all of them. It was a really, truly fantastic production. The Cape Elizabeth High School Jazz Band will be participating in the annual UNH Jazz Festival on Saturday, where they'll be performing, hearing from guest artists, and learning from guest faculty. Um, you should all hear, come hear them play at the end of the month on March 22nd at the annual CHS Jazz Cabaret, which will also feature the eighth grade jazz band. Um, ELO has been having a really great, strong sem um, second semester with multiple students participating in internships. Specifically, we have students um, working with organizations such as Portland Immigrant Welcome Center and Kelson Marine Environment environmental engineering, excuse me. Uh, senior Zoe Burgard shared her experience conversing with new Mainers in French, um, which was super cool, and junior Marta leary Fori described her time with Kelson Marine Environment Engineering as motivating and helpful in solidifying her desire to pursue the path in college, so ELO has still been a really great experience for students. Um, the high school is currently participating in Spirit Week, as you can see by Mr. Springer's cool tie. Um, today was a tropical day, um, yesterday was PJ Day, and then there are a lot more exciting themes to come throughout the rest of the week. Um, and all these festivities will culminate in a pep rally on Friday, followed by a masquerade-themed spring dance. Um, and then our CHS Club Unified Basketball team is having a really amazing season. Tons of students are really enjoying being part of that team um, and also coming out to support their peers and their classmates in the games. Um, and then they got some really awesome new headshots um, taken earlier in the week. Um, and so you, if next time that you're in the CHS gym, you can check out those. Um, and then continuing on with spring sports, they've begun their sign-up process um, and are looking forward to this official start of the season on March 25th. Um, and then finally, kind of looking in the future, um, a large group of juniors and seniors will be representing CAPE at the Maine State Science Fair on March 23rd. Um, so students have been working all year on, in their biology classes on research projects of their own design. Um, and so they'll be presenting their work to a panel of judges and then sharing with fellow peers at the fair. So that's all that's been going on. It's a busy month, a <laughs> lot to share. <laughs> Trying to think back to when you started speaking. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate how you and Jack have really um, gotten to all the schools and not just the high school. It's super fun to hear about the fun things going on for the elementary students, the middle school students, and um, the high school students as well. We really appreciate that. No, it's thank you so much, and for repres and, and representing all the students and not just certain groups. It's really nice. I think, and that's what I noticed too. I like hearing that you're going back to Pond Cove and you're talking to the children and you know, just how you're, you're not just reporting on them, but you're involved in their communities too, which is, I really like. No, it's been a pleasure to um, kind of meet the students throughout the grades and hear how everything's been going. Uh, they're all really wonderful. So thank you for helping us expand. <laughs> thank you. So moving on to presentations. I believe Keegan Lathrop is here, the Class B Alpine Skiing State Champion in Slalom. So I don't know if uh, the ski coach is here. I know Keegan is here. So um, would you guys like to come up and just say a couple of words about, like, say something about your season and, and how, just, just it's, it's really okay. Just come up to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> just say a couple of things about how your season went. And then we're going to ask for a picture and we'll let you off the hook. So head on over to the podium. Give us, give us just a, how did the season go? Give us the highlights. So I'm the coach. I'm also Keegan's older brother. That's why I coach. So I'm 
mostly, so good year. Solid skiing from both Logan and Keegan Schwartz, our top boys, but a lot of camaraderie bringing back, you know, the fun in skiing. And that's, you know, we did what we had to do. <laughs> yeah, well said. Uh, <laughs> this season definitely wasn't, wasn't going to be possible without Devin because we didn't have a coach at the start of the season. So uh, huge thanks to Devin and uh, our assistant coach, Tim Riley. He did a great job. But uh, Devin came back. Not sure why, but he did. Uh, came back. Definitely a fun season. Good one to end on. Uh, I'm going to miss it, but it was definitely fun. Thank you. Congratulations. Great job. Next, we'd like to recognize some student writing contest winners. Are Isla Litton and Zabina Zimmerman here? Come on up, please. And thank you, Ms. Rubin, for explaining a little bit about this. I'm going to explain a little bit. I didn't tell them. I told them they didn't have to speak. They're writers. They don't have to speak and read their writing. So, <laughs> um, so this fall, eighth grader, uh, our, one of our eighth, eighth grade teachers, Hannah Hyde, challenged her students to write about a teacher who had made an impact on their lives. Um, for the past two years, the Maine County and State Teachers of the Year Association, in partnership with the Maine Council of English Language Arts, has held a student writing contest that showcases the outstanding talent of students and the incredible impact of teachers in Maine. And Dr. Hyde saw an opportunity to put her students writing into a real life contest, which was super exciting. And out of it, we got two winners in the sixth to eighth grade writing category of the statewide contest. Um, our eighth graders, Isla Litton and Sabina Zimmerman. Um, Isla won first place in the sixth to eighth grade writing contest, and I'm going to read just a small excerpt of her piece. His intricate teaching style could only be described as a tightly woven scarf. On the outside, it's a scarf, like any other. But if you take a close look, really look at the scarf, you'll see the minuscule threads that make it up. You really have to get to know him to see those small threads that make him up. So that was a piece from Isla's, poem, from Isla's writing. And Zabita Zim Zimmerman won an honorable mention for her submission. And I'll read a little excerpt of hers. I was really young, so I did not understand everything that was happening, but I knew it made me happy. My painting was put on the front page of the local paper. I couldn't have done it without Mrs. Johnson. From then on, there was a confidence in me. I brought the confidence with me, but kept it inside. Mrs. Johnson made me feel an inner confidence, and I found art as an outlet. I still love to draw and paint. Mrs. Johnson changed my life. She showed me that school is not scary. It can be fun. I just need to look at it in a new way. She allowed me to be creative and taught me to believe in myself. And those are some excerpts. And so we're just really proud of the work that Isla and Zabina did, and really grateful that Dr. Hyde gave them this opportunity. So thanks. You guys want to come? All right, next up, we are pleased to have a presentation from Liz McAvoy, the Executive Director of CEIF, and Sherry Bragg, Grants Chair. 
Thank you for joining us tonight. All right. Um, as Ms. Seifrey said, I am Liz McAvoy, Executive Director of the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. And I'm actually here tonight both with Sherry Bragg, who is our grant chair, and Eliza Sandals, who is our board president. Um, so excited to have them here. And we're excited to be here to give you some background information on C for those of you who aren't as familiar with it. Uh, as well as to just give you some, some information about some of our grants that we've done. Um, CEEF was established in 2002 by a group of parents who wanted to support Cape schools by funding innovative initiatives that would otherwise fall outside of the school budget. Their mission was to find ways to enhance educational opportunities across the schools and district and engage community support for the schools as well for the, through the foundation. Uh, for 22 years, CEEF has adhered to that mission by funding projects that benefit all three schools. To date, we have funded 336 grants, uh, totaling over $1.5 million. Um, our grants are currently awarded four times a year. We have two dates in the fall and two dates in the spring to coincide with the school schedule. And we were fortunate enough um, just last week to have awarded four grants in the first of our spring grant cycles. Uh, these grants, recent grants, are a great example of the creativity of CAPE educators, and we're excited to tell you a little bit about those. Uh, the first grant is one to the five fourth grade teachers uh, for a residency program by the Telling Room. Uh, who will spend 10 weeks in, in the fourth grade classrooms working with students to produce a piece of writing, helping them craft and edit, and ultimately to produce a published book of their work. Um, the students get an opportunity to work with writers and telling room volunteers who can help them really learn to craft their writing and really show them that every one of them can be a writer. Uh, this is a grant that will take place in the spring of 2025. Uh, the second grant is a middle school grant, which went to the fifth grade team of Heather Geike and Dave Croft for a gnome village around Cape Elizabeth. Um, so stick with me on this one. Uh, this is a project that Mr. Croft actually saw while hiking on land trust trails around Rangeley and thought it was a great way to engage his students. Um, the fifth grade students will build, create, and decorate gnomes and gnome houses, think like a small birdhouse type of structure, um, while working in their classrooms and in the art classroom. Uh, each student will also write a poem, a story, or some other narrative piece that will be av um, available by a QR code that will be affixed to the house. Um, the houses are then temporarily installed on salt trails and even possibly some of the town-owned trails uh, for hikers to enjoy. And as in Rangeley, they are also hoping to produce a punch pass so visitors can keep tracks of which ones they are visiting. Um, we really thought this was an exciting grant because it engages math, creativity, and writing skills. And we love the fact that it's sort of a town-wide collaboration between CEEF, the schools, CELT, and even the town itself, possibly. Um, in fact, we thought so highly of um, the grant that we made funding available not just for the Geike Croft team, but for the other fifth grade teams if they wish to participate this spring. Um, the third grant from last week is also a middle school grant, um, which was awarded to Caitlin Ramsey and Missy Shabo for sound and visual improvements for band instruction. Um, because the current band rooms are, were not originally meant to be for that type of instruction, they have encountered some visual and acoustic limitations while working in there. So they worked with Troy Patterson and the technology integrators to see what would work for them and what's working at Pine Cove. <laughs> and ultimately came to us for funding for, to install two wireless sound systems and a swivel wall-mounted TV so that all students can actually hear and see them in both rooms when they are conducting and teaching. They can post assignments and music up there, um, so really helping them um, reach all of their students. Um, the fourth grant was a high school grant to Rob Wheeler, who came to us for funding for an artist in residency by uh, Javon Jackson, who is Director of Jazz Studies at the Hart School of Music at the University of Hartford, and one of the last members of Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers. And if you're a jazz fan, this is really exciting to have him here. 
Um, although this grant was awarded to Mr. Wheeler, Mr. Jackson will actually be um, working with high school and middle school jazz students and uh, participating in the annual jazz cabaret. Uh, one of the other things that we really liked about this grant is that it's co-funded by HSPA, MSPA, and the High School Music Boosters. We love to see when there's this sort of widespread support for grants and projects. I think that's really great. Uh, and so this was one of those that we really liked. Um, these grants all embrace new ways to engage students and represent the time, energy, and caring that Cape educators put into their classes. Uh, hearing about these new grants from educators is really inspiring to us as an organization and as a board. Um, but I also want to share with you, as some background, um, some of the past grants to highlight the tradition of creative and engaging SEEF projects in Cape schools. Um, at the high school level, uh, this includes funding to establish the Achievement Center as well as Freshman Academy. Uh, we've awarded grants to begin a beekeeping club, renovate the teacher's lounge, fund end of year trips and activities for the Women's Leadership Academy, and have supported the robotics program from the beginning and as it has expanded across the district. We've also seen an increase in student-led grants come to our board, um, including Afterthought by Hadley Johnson, which was absolutely amazing. Um, as well as a new study app to be used in the high school, the design and launch of a biofuel rocket, and well as the introduction of gender diversity uh, in CPR training by Sophia Toon, who actually just happens to be here, <laughs> which is a great grant. Um, and CPR training is something that every student at the high school receives, so it was really a very um, timely, it was a great grant. Uh, at the middle school, one grant that certainly made an impact was funding to bring artists Rachel and Ryan Adams uh, to work with students to design and paint the mural representing CEMS near the fifth grade wing. Uh, we funded the establishment of a mindfulness director position and have been strong supporters of place and project-based learning for grants, um, place and project-based learning with grants for aquaculture, podcasting, outdoor classrooms, seventh and eighth grade work at Turkey Hill Farm and a series of experiential, tech, experiential learning activities and field trips for eighth graders. Uh, we funded expanded technology for the CEMS broadcast studio for student news reports. Um, and we also renovated the teacher's lounge as well as the CEMS underground space used by Erica Marcus and others. Um, and we are certainly excited about the handful of student-led grants that we have gotten from the middle school, and we're really hoping to see more of those come our way as well. Um, it's exciting to see some of the younger students take charge and take the lead on those. Um, at Pine Cove, we've awarded grants for, the, for Natureland at the Pine Cove Playground, numerous visiting authors and illustrators for workshops or week-long residencies, including the current one by Lynn Cabral, uh, world maps, decodable books for every first grade classroom, telescopes for a first grade moon view viewing experience, and a mindfulness in the classroom program for teachers. Our grants at each school cover mental health, fine arts, STEM, world language, professional development, and more. CEEF has a tradition of encouraging educators to dream big and then bring us those ideas. And we are certainly looking forward to another 20 years of that happening. Uh, these grants are simply just a sampling of those that we have awarded over the past 22 years um, and some of the work that Steve has done. We are happy to talk about any and all of them uh, and welcome any questions that you would have. Okay. okay. Can I get to jump in? I'd like to Go wait. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See, I just want to, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody that's a part of Steve. This is an excellent, I mean, I, it could be going too far, but it feels like a, just a wonderful partnership. And yeah. we, I believe everybody in this town, I know this school board and the school department are, just are so grateful oh, thank you. for the work that SEAF does. And it is so exciting. Uh, I have not heard a lot about um, student grants, but mm -hmm. I mean, lately it does seem like students are more and more getting involved and that is really exciting. It's really exciting. They're some of the most the presentations we get when the students come are just absolutely inspiring. Um, they're so mature. They've really worked through um, the grant application. They have everything lined up, their budgets, what's going to happen. It's incredibly impressive. Um, so we love to see them. And like I said, we have had two or three from the middle school, which is fun to see. So when those younger kids can come up, in fact, um, I think the mural 
although Marguerite worked on that the most, um, was initially kind of a student idea, and we did have students come in and present um, part of that with her, so that was really special. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for providing these enriching opportunities. Oh, thanks, we love it, so we're excited. Anything else? No, I just, I'd thank you for coming. I think I'd ask oh, yeah. a question about your programming, and, and it's, it's really because um, I think you're such an important part of what we do, but we, this is my fifth year now on the board, and I realize I yep. never really heard comprehensively <laughs> Um, you hear obviously in the reports you do, and sort of anecdotally, if you go to the new t at the beginning of the year, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I was at the when the teachers come back, um, yep, and so it, it's nice to hear all that. So as we're crafting budgets and policy, we realize it's yeah. sort of outside of that, but it really enriches what what the schools are offering, and so it's really a partnership. So um, thank you for coming. It was really good to hear all that together in one place. No, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having us. I think it's great um, to give you all a little bit more of an idea, a comprehensive idea of what we're doing and kind of an overview. So, well, thank you. It's been Thanks. a pleasure. We think it's a great partnership as well. Like I said, we're, we've been here for 22 years, and we're certainly looking forward to doing more of it every year. So. I'll say also, yep. um, and echoing what they say, it's, it's you know, aware of CEF, but as you were you know, giving us a description of the range of projects, yep. so many of them were like, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea that all of these, the, the right. breadth of what you do um, and how enriching it is for all three levels. And also as an editorial aside, I love the gnome village idea. I can't, <laughs> <laughs> we I loved can't, it too. I can't wait to yeah. see that. Yeah, yeah, you first like a gnome village and then it's, it's really a neat project. So, which is why we um, made the decision to expand the funding for that if other, uh, fifth grade teachers want to jump in on that. So it's really a neat project. So a lot of enthusiasm. Yep. And again, I echo everything that Jill said. Then just thank grab you. the mic. Oh, I echo what everybody else said and wanted to say thank you. But for the public, what is your funding source? What are your different fundraisers that, you know, people might want to contribute to or participate in? Uh, for the most part, we just do, we do an annual appeal um, and looking for donations from the town. Um, like you said, we have a very supportive town and a supportive of education, so that's been our main um, fundraising goal. We do an annual uh, golf tournament, which is a fundraiser, and then we do, hopefully biannual, um, a Cape Elizabeth Kitchen Tour, which we sponsored this past September. Um, so there probably will be another one, hopefully in 2025, so we don't do that. Actually, I have one more question. Yeah. What are the, um, for student grants, what are the amounts that they can request? Uh, the student grants are treated just like every other grant. The process is the same. There's no limit on the amount of um, grant that can be requested. That's for students or for educators. Uh, it's really what do you need and what can we do? And we, we evaluate theirs with the same criteria as we do any other grant. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? We, are, we do want a picture with you three, though, if you're willing to come up. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm we don't mind. My we don't mind. I know. I'm going to go right between <laughs> Sherry and Liz, and it'll be fine. <laughs>
This means now that our expenditure patterns are matching the pre-pandemic numbers, which is also normalizing our historical average. I would like to give an update on the school nutrition program for the month of February. They served 14,117 lunches and 4,905 breakfast meals. The revenue from this state claim for February will be $72,310. This is $7,000 up from last year at this time. We also received an additional $8,353 from the State Department of Education as an additional state grant. We are running slightly behind right now with our expenditures compared to our overall revenues. However, March is the month I'm using to determine our projections for the end of the year, primarily because that is our largest month for the entire year, for every year. And February also had three pay periods, which is um, throwing the numbers off just slightly for the projections. So at the end of March, I'll be have a better idea of how we will be by June 30th for school nutrition. Any questions? Questions? Thank you so much. Next up, we have our superintendent's report. All right. It's March. Um, very it's, Marchy. It's very Marchy, but um, <laughs> soon enough, it will be light out when we leave this meeting in a few months. So I just want to thank Sophia again for that great report. Uh, that's exciting. All of those things happening in our district and to hear it from you. Uh, from other students, uh, just so exciting. It makes all this work worth it to hear that. And uh, extend my thanks to SEAF uh, for their incredible contributions uh, to our schools. All right, uh, in terms of my report, uh, School Building Advisory Committee, uh, continuing an impressive uh, amount of work. Um, that committee has been together for over a year. Um, we meet regularly. Uh, for communications, for finance, and uh, at least twice a month, if not more, for our, our big committee. Uh, in fact, last Thursday night, uh, we were here till, uh, I think it was 11 o'clock, uh, talking about important things, but we are working, and I really appreciate the five committee members, uh, community members that are part of it, uh, our two school board members and two town councilors that are dedicating hundreds of hours to this. Um, we are making progress, I believe that, Right now we have three, uh, three different projects or, or solutions, as I like to call them, that we're looking at. Um, we're hoping or aiming to get down to one on May 2nd. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, we're also working on a, a new survey, um, still in the works. Uh, when that will go out, what it will entail, we have a lot of work to do on that, but we're working on it. Um, and I'm really pleased that Harriman, uh, the great architects, Lisa and her team, are now back in our schools, uh, meeting with staff, uh, sharing them the progress, sharing them the solutions, and getting their feedback, because after all, it is about our staff and our students. That's why we're doing this. Um, so I'm glad that's happening. So I'm sure Cindy will share more later on, um, but I think we're really making good progress, uh, and I'm hopeful. Um, enrollment numbers are, are steady, uh, very similar to where we were last year. Um, so that's on track. Uh, I don't know how, uh, Tiffany, if you can tell me uh, kindergarten enrollment numbers. Uh, yeah. 87 as of right now, and I believe when we talked, you said that was a little ahead of where we typically are um, in our budget meeting. So 87 enrolled so far in kindergarten. So we're on track there. We'll keep an eye on enrollment numbers because obviously that impacts uh, teacher decisions and all that. Um, Otherwise, for me, I, I just am uh, immensely proud of, of all the work of our staff, um, all that they do every day. A lot of it's hidden. We don't see it. Um, they, only, they only know it and do it and, and make this such a successful district from pre-K all the way through senior year of high school. Um, so a lot to be proud of. So that's my report. Uh, any questions for me? All right. Thank you. So we're moving on to new business, but when I ask for a motion, I would like that person to please make um, the motion of 9E, and then we'll jump back to A. So E would be sabbatical leave. Okay? 
Do them in the order that we. Yep. Right. Very sensitive mic tonight. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I make a motion to consider to consider approving the sabbatical leave request of Joanna Payne for the 2024-2025 school year. Second. Discussion? Yes, so I can share a little bit about this. Uh, the board has, has been informed about this already and had a chance to meet with Joanna and talk through this. Um, Joanna's been uh, a wonderful teacher at the middle school um, for several years. Um, she has an interest in studying uh, Wabanaki studies uh, and developing a curriculum uh, for fifth through eighth grade, uh, designing integrated units. Um, that it would involve humanities and science uh, and involve the community. Um, she's designed an approach where she is going to be working with experts within our district, uh, including Michael Young, uh, Mark Ash, and Karen Ferry from their schools. She'll be reaching out to museums within the state. She'll be reaching out to universities, uh, other school districts around the state that are, are well, well versed at this work. Um, so. She's diving in really to advance uh, our understanding of, of Wabanaki studies and really actually following LD 291, uh, which is a law that um, says we need to do this. But even if it wasn't a law, it's really important for our, to help our students have greater understanding and our staff to have greater understanding uh, of the history here. So I'm fully supportive of this. Um, she would be on sabbatical for next year um, and she would come back to us uh, full of knowledge about the correct cur curriculum instruction and assessment, share that with the staff, regularly work with them and really advance our work in this area. So I'm excited about this. Uh, and uh, Principal Rubin expressed uh, great support as well. Um, so um, I hope you vote yes on this. Any questions for me? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you, and thank you for being willing to do this work on behalf of the district. So we have, doesn't look like, is there a separate? There's not a separate item. So I think you'll just have to kind of reread it, change the name, and I believe it is a half year. Right. Gosh, I'm sorry, this thing is very aggressive tonight. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to consider the approval of the sabbatical, of approve the sabbatical leave request of Melissa Bam for half of the 2024-2025 school year. <laughs> that was really helpful. Huh? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Anybody willing second. to second? I'll second. I'll second. Thank you. Oh, man. That's funny. Three stooges up here. I know. Okay. Uh, we had a chance to speak uh, with Melissa Bam uh, this evening, learn more about her proposal. Um, she's been a special educator in Cape for 13 years and an educator for 17, I believe. Um, really has done a great job for us at Pond Cove. Uh, she's really interested in learning more, studying about multi-tiered system of supports. Um, so it's basically how do we, uh, what supports do we offer students? What sort of structures do we have in place? What kind of screening tools do we use? How do we make a more integrated approach between regular education and special education? So she's collaborated uh, with the Ponco principal, Tiffany and, and Ryan, our, our special uh, services director on designing this. She's planning to um, really examine what we're doing now, uh, what's working, what could be better, and then really engage with other school districts that have these systems in place, find out what works for them, how does it work. Um, she's gonna do a lot of research in terms of uh, reading and studying um, and really collaborate throughout her sabbatical with leaders in the district so we make sure we're all going in the same direction um, and we have a great understanding. I think this is a real need for us. Uh, we need to improve our systems at Pond Cove, uh, certainly actually K-12 in this area and I think this will really advance our work. So. I'm a full supporter of this, as I know uh, Tiffany and Ryan are as well. Any questions? All those in favor? Thank you. And thank you for being willing to do this work. All right. 
moving backwards before we move forwards. So item 9A, we can give everybody a chance to go where we need to be. May I have a motion, please? I move to uh, approve the 2024-2025 school year calendar. Second. All right, Chris and Phil. All right, I'll, I'll share a little bit about the process and give some highlights of the calendar. Um, building a school calendar sounds easy. Um, <laughs> Does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> but uh, it's quite a process. It involves lots of stakeholders, including parents, staff, administrators, school board members, myself, Michelle. Um, and we've met multiple times over the last few months, um, sought feedback from staff, feedback from parents, got input from the school board in the fall, um, and really went about how do we look at what we're doing currently, how do we make some improvements um, that help students, help staff, and help parents. And any one of you up here would probably design it differently. Any parent would, any teacher would any superintendent might, right? We all have different views of what we think is important and how to balance it. So it, it's challenging, it really is, but I think we, we made progress on the calendar as we have every year I've been here um, in meeting the needs of students on turn, and staff and parents on when we start the year, what, what we offer professional developments um, and how we try to end the year. So some quick highlights. Um, You'll see it's very quite similar to this year's calendar. Um, we do believe it provides more consistent weeks for students and staff. Um, you'll particularly see that probably in October and January. Um, so less breakup of the weeks as best we can with, with holidays, of course. Uh, you'll notice there's no early release for uh, fall conferences that's been moved out of out of the calendar. You'll also notice that kindergarten screening has also been moved out of the calendar. And I really appreciate the staff and, and administrators that are gonna have to figure some of this out. How do conferences work? How does kindergarten screening work? Um, so I appreciate that. Um, Cause I know it's not easy. It's not easy to change. Um, you will notice that the eight professional development days are clearly marked on the calendar. Uh, we thought that was important, so they're clearly deline delineated. Um, you'll notice um, most, uh, most of our days fall on Fridays, but we are trying a February uh, 3rd is a Monday professional development day. Um, that was a suggestion from someone on the committee to try it on Monday uh, when our teachers are fresh, um, but still allowing parents and families to have potentially a three-day weekend. So. There's a lot I could say about this. Um, I do, uh, one last thing I wanna point out, um, the middle school start time on here is gone from 7.55 to 7.50. Um, that was uh, requested by uh, the middle school administration um, and they would end the day at 2.20. So it's the same amount of time. Um, it just allows for um, them to have home base first thing in the morning before students start regular classes. So. That's a quick summary. Uh, Phil, you were part of the process. Uh, love to hear your input and answer any questions. Yeah, thank you. Well, you, you covered all the highlights, but I, um, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, I thought the process, I really, it was my first year on the calendar committee, and I thought everyone uh, put in the time, and we really worked well together. Um, and it was good to hear everyone's perspective. There's a, a lot of different perspectives on the board, on the committee. Um, I, just to bring it back to where the board, we had a discussion at a workshop and we did have a couple of goals and I think we've accomplished them or made some progress toward those. One was um, kindergarten screening, which I think had been sort of a experiment in some ways. It only happened for a couple of years, but there was a desire to, to take that time back for our kindergarten students. And, and so you'll see that that and um, working with administration and I know the principal had I was gonna work on that, but we will uh, take that time back for the kindergarten students and that will happen at a different time period. The other, um, we talked about election day and we have um, sort of, I guess you'd call it a compromise. Um, and so the, um, uh, the high school will be uh, in, right? So we left it with um, remote. Yeah, the high school's remote on yeah. election day, K-8 are in person. That's right, so we, we, we will have an election day 
uh, school day this year. It's just that it's a little different than how it's going to work because obviously the election happens at the high school, so we're going to do a remote day. And then finally, we talked about um, moving conferences out of the school day, uh, again, both to reclaim some, some teaching time, but also I think um, we heard, we did, uh, superintendent did a survey, and it was sort of overwhelmingly from the parent community, and I think even a lot of the staff, actually, depending on the building, um, supported that concept. So we didn't, we didn't go all the way there this year, but in my view, I think we made some good progress, and we can revisit next year and see how it goes. Um, so you'll see in the fall, the fall conference is outside. Um, we did keep a half day in the spring, so that's where we landed. So I think we took a step in the direction of what we're hearing from, from the parents and, and the staff, and, um, and, we'll, and I think it's always good to see how it works, and we can revisit it next year. But I think it was a good process, and I'm, it's a good calendar from my perspective. Will the earlier start time at the middle school impact the bus schedules? Yeah, great question. Um, we reviewed that with our transportation director, and they, I believe the buses actually get there at 735 with the students, so it fits perfectly, actually. Yeah. Good question. I appreciate looking at these kind of longer blocks where we have uninterrupted weeks. Like you said, October, January, uh, March is always okay, I guess. <laughs> Great from a teaching perspective, but it's nice to see those long blocks where people can really build some stamina and, and build some connections. I didn't mention this, but it's important for the public to know um, that our calendar has to be within five days of alignment with the other sending schools to PAS. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that's one of the things that constricts some of our options and our choices. Um, so that was part of it. Um, also starting after Labor Day, um, bringing all students after Labor Day does push us later into June. So we're cognizant of where Juneteenth is and how that works. Um, and this calendar also highlights that the first two I don't even know if we can call them snow days anymore. The first two weather days will be a uh, traditional model, and then after that, um, we'll move to virtual if, if we can, if conditions allow. So if that, we, have this year. We, we have had no official yeah. snow days. Maybe none, wow. Not yet. Come on, Phil, why just? <laughs> Phil. At a minimum, uh, it would be the latest we'll have one. Right, <laughs> and I know if you're looking at this, um, you know, June 16th on here, uh, is the last day for students, and that's on a Monday, but we recognize most years we will have at least some some snow, and that will in, impact the end date. But we, we should finish with students and hopefully staff before Juneteenth, which will be nice. Thank you both for your work on this, and thank you to everybody who participated on this co committee. Are there any further questions or comments? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Everybody will be excited to plan their vacations. Right? And I, I do have a, an explanation sheet um, that I think is in materials. I'll also get that out to staff and parents and students that helps explain the calendar. Because to me, when I look at this, it all makes sense. But if you're just looking at it the first time, it's probably confusing. So that will be going out as well. And actually, one more highlight, because it came up to our conversation, you'll see that we kept the half day for the fifth and ninth graders. I think that was important. We heard from the building administrators as well. So it wasn't that it was at risk, but it, we had talked about it. So that, that, that is still in there. And that day is when they go into the buildings by themselves right. to just acclimate. <clears throat> right. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Item 9B. Wait, may I have a motion, please? Make a motion to consider the approval of the CEHS program of studies for the 2024 to 2025 academic year. Second. I think it was Kathleen. I think it was Kathleen. <laughs> All right, and we have Principal John Springer. Good evening. Give us the highlights and any explanation you would like to give. Yeah, so you do, you do have the red line version too, right? Um, I, we did online. Yep, but okay. here we go. Yep. Yes, a little bit of a struggle to print. Um, so as always, I mean, I think there's some typical changes in here. Um, I'll highlight a couple of them. Um, sort of the, the information near the beginning of the program of studies, we've really tried to sort of consolidate sort of where some of this information is, some of existed 
I guess a little bit in policy there's an overlap, but there was some in the beacon, some in the program of study. So you'll see that a number of things um, have been added in the first pages about sort of SDP projects, early graduation, um, grade weighting, transcripts. Um, a lot of those things have been added. So where those came from was the beacon and then we'll be sort of looking to sort of maybe shrink and consolidate that down. Um, and so that's the major change at the beginning. I'll also note that there was an addition of um, a note about prerequisites and which was a request from the public. Um, so we did include that in there, which hasn't been in either document before. Um, but really that's a representation of something that is a practice that we already follow. We don't currently waive prerequisites um, to move from classes that the students haven't met. So, um, but that is an addition and that has not been in there before. Um, other additions, of course, you'll see some new classes in there. We talked about the, maybe at the budget meeting, um, Sophie had talked about the science research and students right now are sort of doing that in addition to their regular class and there'll be a science research component to the ELO programming. So they'll do those projects um, in conjunction with ELO. So they'll be doing their typical ELO process, but also having independent time to do independent research. Um, there's some other new classes. Um, one, one's actually going on right now. It's sort of piloted this year, which is sort of um, a sort of modern take on home ec, I guess I would say. Um, and there were posters around the high school. So you'll see that in there. Um, there's also some of the new classes we talked about uh, last week, which is sort of in um, the environment and economics. Some of those things are all in there. And then there's, of course, some additional language changes, updates from department chairs if they're looking to change language around course descriptions. Those are all done by uh, department chairs. One thing we also added in here that hadn't been in here previously is for AP courses and any other courses. We just added a note if there's a fee for the for the class um, and for the exam. Of course, we um, always work to meet uh, families' needs that um, meet the criteria for us to support them in the, with those. But um, just to make sure that people are aware that, say, for like a Woods class or something, there might be a fee attached to that. So that's in here, which was on in here before. Um, most other things are just um, sort of clerical changes or punctuation mishaps that were corrected from previous versions, um, but happy to take any questions as well. I noticed there were several updates uh, within the computer science classes. And so, mm -hmm. um, it's like for an example, um, I think it was the intro to computer science. Mm -hmm. um, it's now, or I'm sorry, intro to computer programming was previously computer science principles. Is it still the same class or is it really a different class I mean, it, for all intents and purposes, I mean, Alex is just updating the language and the title of the class. I mean, um, like there are some new classes like video game design, which is completely new, um, but just updating some components of the, the curriculum and he just felt that it was a more <coughs> appropriate name. Um, but in general, yes, I mean, it's sort of um, about similar concepts in computer science. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you. Uh, number one, I appreciate um, sort of reorganization and adding some information in um, wherever it may have existed and even if it was just in kind of um, institutional. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's really nice to have that in there for students and, um, and I appreciate your willingness to stand here and talk to us about it. We need, we need to be able to ask those questions and um, understand how all this works. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Any further discussion? So I also think, I, and I know we had discussed this a little bit in a workshop. Um, I there was reference to the um, kind of going to a slow transition to the Latin honor system. Is that mentioned in here? Is that um, I don't know if John wanted to comment on that or if that's I something that we did. Right? did question I, did on I Latin honors. And yeah, there was a mention of it. I didn't know if we had. Recognitions. Yeah. Thank you. What was I, oh. I'm recalling what I, I'm trying to, to find top it. Um, the top 10%. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, it's off the head. Yep, so we're the, 
just where we are with that and why it's not in here, or why it's yeah. So we're in the process of finalizing sort of um, what our plan is, where we're gonna move to for student recognition. Um, and we did debate whether to put it in here or not, but we felt like we should go through the entire process, mm -hmm. bring it through policy committee of things that would be in there um, before making an assumption that everybody would be fine with those details. Um, so it's not in here. We can certainly add it as an addendum afterwards. Um, I just didn't want to be presumptive about questions people may still have and people feel like a decision's been made without the appropriate input from everyone. Okay, okay. I think I may have seen an earlier draft. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions? All those in favor? Thank you. All right. Item 9C may have a motion, please. Make a motion we approve the superintendent's recommendation for <coughs> administrator contract renewals. Nathan Carpenter, the Cape Elizabeth High School Assistant Principal. Sarah Forey Pettit, Pond Cove Elementary School Assistant Principal. Jay Kogovic, Cape Elizabeth Middle School Assistant Principal. Troy Patterson, Educational Technology Director. Sarah Rubin, Cape Elizabeth Middle School Principal, John Springer, Cape Elizabeth High School Principal, and Jeff Thorak, the Athletic Administrator. Second. Dr. Rucker, could you speak a little bit to this? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak generally. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think Michelle and I talk about this regularly, how proud we are of this team um, and how we're really building a strong district leadership team full of, of great leaders who do a good job in their programs and or buildings. Um, and we are moving this district forward. And as Michelle said long ago in her interview, uh, aligning the arrows. Um, and that takes a lot of work and it's complicated to run schools and run programming in schools, but I'm really proud of this group. Um, so I absolutely support um, these people having their contracts renewed. Can you talk just briefly about um, why we're doing this right now and why, you know, why are we doing this separate from the next group? Yes, the, board and um, the, the next group are, are in their first year. Mm -hmm. um, so the people in this group have been here, uh, been in these positions at least two years or in their second year. So now um, they'll be on a two year renewal cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why we're doing it for th this group. We're also by statute, um, we have to inform people whether they're coming back, uh, administrators, whether they're coming back or not uh, by around this time. So you're coming back. <laughs> I hope, well, they haven't voted yet. <laughs> you're coming back. <laughs> I was talking to Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. just for understanding. All right. Any discussion? Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of these people, and it is a pleasure to work with you, and we appreciate you all very much. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. 9D, may I have a motion, please? I make a motion we approve the superintendent's recommendations for administrator contact re <coughs> contract renewals for the 2024-2025 school year. Ryan Fairchild, Director of Special Services, and Tiffany Carnes, Pond Cove Elementary School Principal. Second. I, the words I said before, uh, certainly um, I meant them about these two as well. Um, hard to believe we're already in March and they're almost finished their first year, but they've done an incredible job. Uh, moving their, the school uh, Pond Cove forward and, and special services forward, and I'm so glad they're here with us. So, fully really support uh, you voting yes on them. Discussion? I'd like to thank both of you too, very much. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have done E, so moving to 9F. May I have a motion, please? I make a motion and we approve the head custodian job description or updates to the head custodian job description. Thank you. 
Dr. Recker? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, Dave Bagdasarian couldn't make it this evening, um, but he brought this to the Building and Grounds Committee, um, making some updates to this position uh, to more be in alignment with what we're asking from our head custodian. A uh, really important role uh, organizing um, these really uh, vital employees. Um, so this is really designed to outline what we expect from the head custodian so it's very clear um, what their job is and uh, what we're asking them to do. So um, I support these changes. I think it will, it will make us uh, more effective with this position. Thank you. Questions or discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Nine G. May I have a motion, please? Uh, move that we approve the removal of policy JJH interrupted study from the policy manual. Uh, so this got its first read at our February 13th business meeting. We've not received any comments. Um, just as a reminder, our proposal was to delete this policy from the policy manual and move it to the high school handbook, the beacon. Uh, the rationale for this is this really is an administrative policy um, that details how the guidance office communicates with students and family who are considering periods of learning away from or outside of Cape High School. Questions or discussion? Just want to clarify. I think you said administrative policy, but I think you intended administrative procedure. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 9H. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve policy JKF, Disciplinary Removal of Students with Disabilities. Second. Um, first read of JKF was at our February 13th business meeting. This policy was last reviewed in 2012 and its accompanying procedure that we'll talk about in a minute was last reviewed in 2008. Um, our Director of Special Education, Ryan Fairchild, has reviewed both of these and confirm that the policy and the procedure continue to be consistent with current statutory and regulatory requirements. There are no um, substantive revisions to either just a change to a legal citation in JKF. Um, we did get some public comment and, and questions about this policy and its impact on students with disabilities and um, this gave us a chance to have Ryan come to the policy committee meeting last week, I think. Um, and we had a really good discussion about um, the, uh, what, this, what this policy and accompanying procedure looks like, how it's enacted in the district, what the different elements of making this happen are. Um, and he was able to explain um, and, and really help us understand how this policy and the procedure are designed to provide protection for students with disabilities and to ensure equitable access to their education. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And item I. Uh, move to approve procedure JKFR, disciplinary removal of students with disabilities. Second. Um, so as, <coughs> as I said, this is the procedure with um, with more substance than the, the fairly um, brief policy itself that really explains the detail and what this policy looks like. And this, we had a really um, helpful and um, meaningful discussion with Ryan at our meeting last week, which I think helped us all understand it much better. Thank you, and I appreciate, um, I understand that, that procedures don't typically go through first read and second read, and um, having seen the comments from the public the policy is like you said it's very brief and it might it could be easily misunderstood and so um, reading procedure and then kind of processing through and I imagine I can imagine um, how Ryan talked about it which is it really is very 
protective of students and, and, and you know, if this, then that, and very, very careful. So um, one thing I did have a discussion with Superintendent Record about, and this is gonna be my apology to Ryan because I am not an administrator, um, but I suggested that maybe we wanna think about when people uh, um, initially come into special education that they either receive a list with links or a packet of policies just so they know that these policies exist. A lot of parents who aren't on school board or whatever don't really even know what the policies are, where they are, that sort of thing. And I think sometimes a little, a little work up front can, you know, enhance communication, enhance um, relationship, and then maybe save uh, difficulty later on. So it was a thought. Um, not to add extra work, but it might help. Because it, it, it felt like there were a couple of parents who were just like, we didn't even know this existed, and it's sort of like, I hear that a lot, and it's not just about special ed, so. My two cents, <laughs> thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. All right, and first read policies, no vote. Short and sweet on first read. Um, policy JLCEA, managing students with food allergies. Uh, this was last reviewed in 2005, and the update that you'll see here is language that was proposed by our school nurses um, regarding patient, apparent communication with school nurses on student allergy claims. Any comments or questions from the board at this time? always send an email before the next policy committee meeting. All right. So, item 10 is school board agenda requests. Requests can be made through myself or the superintendent. Email is the best. Moving on to committee reports. Um, paths, so interestingly, Paths met twice before our last meeting and zero times before this meeting, so nothing to say yet. Paths will meet later this week. Um, technology committee, Heather is not with us tonight, and I'm trying to look out to the, I don't know if they met Troy. recently. Has, great, thank you. A technology committee will be meeting soon, that is the update. I don't know if the mics picked you up, that's all. And then SBAC, Cindy. We've met. I think we've <laughs> met enough to cover paths and the technology committee and all that. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'll just expand a little bit on what Chris has already said. Um, yes, we've all been busy. Uh, we are at a stage where Harriman has, um, well, the, the committee has um, narrowed potential solutions for the school needs down to three options. Um, there are two that are levels of renovation and then one would um, be include a new middle school with some level of renovation potentially to the elementary school um, we're in a phase right now where Harriman's really kind of working on what those options will will look like and also uh, calculating you know having estimates for the cost and from the communications committee perspective we're really working on focusing on um, addressing, you know, letting the public know about what the needs are in the schools and how each option um, is a solution for those needs or what, what's, what things are um, solved by each option that we're presenting. Uh, we hope to also schedule some school tours uh, in the spring um, so that we can get the public into the buildings to really see and, and understand um, what we're talking about. And then the Finance Committee has been very busy as well, uh, working to understand the tax impacts for each, uh, each option, as well as different, um, they're, they're working with Matt and the town finance team on kind of overall capital improvement planning. And then they're looking into things like grant opportunities or you know, rebates for different types of energy use and things like that. So they're uh, doing a lot of hard work there. And our goal is really to pull all of that research and information together by the time we are presenting the three options to the public so that when um, we have a public forum on April 4th, 
where those three options will be presented to the public. And by that time, we hope to have, um, you know, kind of a comprehensive view of each. We'll understand what it will look like, what issues it addresses, um, you know, kind of the benefit of each and an understanding of the, the cost of each. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, I think they also wanted to schedule, uh, the architects have talked about trying to schedule a time to come and present to you all, the rest of the school board, about um, the work that they've been doing. Sorry if you said that, and I didn't try to listen for it. Uh, so I think um, they're also going to be trying to do that same briefing to town council to make sure that both of the voting boards are um, just, as, just as familiar with everything as, as those of us who have been... <laughs> In the meetings are yeah thanks for that and I think one option we, we considered is actually uh, we have joint workshops scheduled already for budget and potentially figured out averaging that, that yeah I think the intent there is to inform the school board and town council about yeah. the options but not really a rich discussion between the two because obviously the people that really know right now are s back uh, members and you're all just learning so I think it's more of an information night okay. great thank you both so buildings and grounds um, so Jen and myself uh, represent the board for buildings and grounds um, we met at the we keep bouncing around to different places we were at the middle school library last time and uh, Dave Bagdazarian uh, gave us a uh, pretty exciting update about the um, security vestibule at Upon Cove, which um, seems like the best solution that we can have right now. Um, and so it, and I don't know, at the time it wasn't fully operational yet. It sounds like I'm talking about the Death Star. It was not fully operational. Um, but so hopefully going forward that is um, involving uh, I, I feel like it's still left in a light, the light and, and lots of visibility and that sort of thing and, and allows for that sort of, you know, airlock experience where you're not just going in there and, and being... And I, I'll stress, it, it's an improvement, but it's certainly not how we would design a new school today. Um, there are still many more improvements that we hope, right. hope to make. There's still no um, direct visibility from the main right. office. You're still pretty far away. Um, interacting with an adult. It's an improvement. It's an improvement, yep. and I appreciated that. Um, he updated us on um, our HVAC, uh, what are the rooftop units? Yes. And um, kind of spoke at length, particularly about um, the Pond Cove and Middle School uh, rooftop units, which all are, what did he say, 30 years old? 30, 30 years or old. more? Okay and that they are uh, no longer manufactured, they are no longer supported, and anytime there is a problem with one of those, there's this, you know, okay, is there someone who can literally fabricate, right, because they're not supported anymore, so someone somewhere has to fabricate the part and then come try to fix it, but then the rest of the unit is still 30 years old. Or do we, you know, and that's its own expense, and tricky calculus and then or do we replace that unit when they're all past their lifespan so yet another kind of really important project waiting to see where we go um, but on the good news side of things um, he did highlight that um, SRRF um, monies are out there and that's a school revolving renovation fund um, at the state level um, which he talked about um, HVAC things being usually tier one. And so if, if there's, you know, if there's like an, perhaps a new building, but one building is getting renovated there, you know, there's grant funding. So it was, it felt hopeful is what I'm going to say. And I don't know if I missed anything, Jen. The bathrooms. The bathrooms at the high school need some help, right? And if we were to build a new school, we might not build bathrooms the same way that they were built when the school was originally originally built and he has worked tirelessly trying to find the best way to 
make our current bathrooms more equitable, looking through um, do-it-yourself stuff here at the high school, like here in district, and also what opportunities are out there. And he's continuing to look at that and how we can best meet the needs of our students and having more privacy in those bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the other big thing. That yeah, it was. Out. Thank you. All right. I think that, that's good. That's it for buildings and grounds. Um, announcements of upcoming meetings. So paths is this week on Thursday. Um, SBAC communication subcommittee that I just always check to make sure that's happening. Every yeah. Thursday, every Thursday, 8.30 a.m. <laughs> so I'm just going to say every Thursday at 8.30 a.m. Um, and then we have, it looks like regular SBAC on March 14th at 6.30. Correct. Correct. It's just I like to double check. I'm going to skip down to the school board budget workshop on March 26th at 6.30 p.m. in the high school library. Budget workshops are the best. You need to come. It's good times and good snacks. Um, and I, there, this is grayed out, um, so I'm not sure. Is that? I think we, we're not sure if that's happening. Okay. So possibly SBAC finance, but also possibly not. Policy Committee on March 28th at 4.15 p.m. in the Assistant Superintendent's Office, is that correct? All right, and then regular School Building Advisory Committee on March 28th, 6.30 p.m. right here. We have um, what could be our final, if needed, School Board Budget Workshop on April 2nd, if needed, at 6.30 p.m. in the library at the high school. And then we have the aforementioned SBAC Community Forum with a Harriman Architects presentation about the three preferred options on April 4th, right here in Town Hall at 6 p.m. The other, uh, the first presentation was very well attended and I hope to see that many or more townspeople. I'm oh. looking at this. Thank you, I know. Caitlin and Cynthia yourself as well, Dr. Record, for all that you do for SBAC, because that's a lot of meetings. It's a lot. You know, one more quick update on SBAC, too. We, we will be starting to get more information into the Cape Courier, so um, people should be watching their couriers for more updates on the project and what's happening. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Item 13 may have a motion, please. Motion to adjourn. Didn't have to wait on that second, did I? <laughs> all those in favor? Oh, we didn't vote. Thank you. Thank you all.